was so much good TV in 2022 that I've decided for the first time ever to do a runner-up video, which means that overall, I'm recommending 20 shows. Oh boy! Even if you watch a lot of TV like I do, odds are there's something here that you've missed. And I highly recommend that you check out both videos and check out the shows that you've missed. Because a lot of these are coming back for new seasons and you want to be caught up. Don't be caught off guard when these shows come back and explode even more than they already have. Well, maybe not all. Well, this is the runner-up list. But still, it's really good television. Really good. These are my runners up. So be sure to check out again both videos. Link down below to the other one. And as always, be sure to share your own favorite shows of 2022 down below. You can have 20 spots too. All right, number 20, Moon Knight. Like my movies list, I wanted to put a Marvel show on here. But while Black Panther Wakanda Forever was able to make my top 10, only Moon Knight out of the Marvel shows this year could barely make my top 20, as you can see. Uh, Disney Plus' Star Wars show, Andor, by the way, did make my top 10. Uh, we're a long way from the brilliant MCU shows of 2021. Remember how amazing those were? Oh, it's sad. And I enjoyed elements of the Mar other Marvel shows this year, but Ms. Marvel and She-Hulk got so focused on their messages that they lost sight of what they were at their core, superhero shows. Uh, and while Moon Knight wasn't perfect either, boy, it wasn't perfect, it did not have a big enough budget to accomplish what it needed to, it still managed to capture a sense of adventure and wonder. Plus, it felt like the comic book it was adapting, whereas She-Hulk and Ms. Marvel both came across as somewhat disdainful of their source material. Uh, also, while I think Tatiana Mislani is brilliant casting as She-Hulk, and Amon Vellani is very charismatic, although I have to say, I think miscast as Ms. Marvel, uh, what Oscar Isaac pulls off with Moon Knight's multiple personalities is nothing short of an acting tour de force. Wow, we all fell in love with Mark Spector and Stephen Grant, especially Stephen Grant. Oh, but when they were teaming up together, that was amazing stuff. And now that their origin story is done and Jake Lockley is on the board, uh, we're all very excited for Moon Knight to hit the ground running with season two. And I also hear he's probably, probably going to become an Avenger. We'll see if that's uh, for sure. But I know that's something that Marvel is definitely mulling over. She-Hulk is also likely going to be on that team. And Ms. Marvel is in the Marvels. Uh, but yeah, I think Moon Knight was definitely the best of the bunch this year from Marvel. Number 19, Pam and Tommy. Even with the top 20, I had to cut some shows that I really enjoyed this year. There are still some shows that didn't make the cut. But I kept Pam and Tommy on here for a few reasons, particularly with this runner-up list. I really had to be like, do I really want to highlight this show? Now, the reason I like Pam and Tommy so much is that I think it handles, first off, salacious material quite well. Doing the original story justice, but not exploiting it, exploiting it or coming across as cheap. Also, like a number of other shows that I'm highlighting, we, we see that Pam and Tommy was the big bang of today's internet, celebrity tabloid, and adult entertainment culture. I mean, a lot of that stuff came out of what happened with this, this, this Pam and Tommy tape. Add to that fantastic performances by Sebastian Stan and Lily James, which are not only quite good in terms of acting ability, but they paint both of these characters, well, real people, in a very positive and sympathetic light. I know that Pamela Anderson was very upset about this miniseries, which many of you probably have already typed down below. And she was particularly upset about the casting of Lily James. But I think if she actually watched this show, she'd see that it's one of the most sympathetic and respectful depictions ever of her and what she went through. As well as drawing parallels to what a lot of women have only recently gone, begun to speak out on, and people have finally begun to listen to how women in the public eye are seen and treated. I mean, really, I think Pamela Anderson shut this down when... Pam and Tommy, and it's still getting a lot of awards nominations, thank goodness, but if Pamela Anderson had backed this show, it would have thrust Pamela Anderson, I think, back into the spotlight and back into the current conversation. But she just, she, she benched the show and herself. Uh, number 18, Barry, season three. I mean, you know, it might be like, oh, should they have included Pamela Anderson? Yeah, that would have been nice. You know, shoulda, woulda, coulda. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, this, I think the series really did went above and beyond in terms of doing right by Pamela Anderson. All right, number 18. I mean, we have so many enemies in the world today. Why make an enemy of somebody who's trying to be your friend? Okay, number 18, Barry, season three. Barry, season three isn't treading a lot of new ground, which is why it didn't make my top 10, but it's still a masterfully made dark comedy from its writing to its performances to its directing with Bill Hader emerging, like Ben Stiller, whose show was in my top 10, Severance, 
uh, Bill Hader emerges, emerging as a top comedy director. And while the show isn't breaking, as I said, new ground, it is moving the story forward. Uh, how Noho Hank has become an increasingly complex character has been a delight to watch, uh, as well as continuing to offer intelligent and brutal commentary on how Hollywood works at the lower levels. That, to me, is really interesting and what makes the show unique when there's obviously a lot of commentary on Hollywood in Hollywood. Just watch episode six if you want to see how brilliant this show is. It's like season two, episode five. Both some of the best absurdist, brilliant, dark comedy work of, works of art that you'll ever see. And both are directed by Bill Hader himself. Wow. Number 17, We Crashed. I had to pick here between this and the dropout for this runner-up list, as both shows cover the same topic. Real life, wildly charismatic individuals with absolutely no morality who were able to con legitimate institutions into giving them millions upon millions of dollars. That this would happen more than once in real life is itself fascinating. And I decided to go with We Crashed because Amanda Seyfried is already winning all these awards, rightfully so, but We Crashed has gone largely unnoticed, despite, outside of Seyfried's performance, being the better of the two shows. Uh, while the dropout sometimes drifts into lifetime territory, We Crashed is, and also I think Amanda's, there's some other good performances, but it's not across the board good, like We Crashed is. We Crashed is close to movie quality consistently throughout every episode. And it's a lot of episodes. I think it's like 10 episodes. It's great. And I think that might partially be due to the two movie stars at its center. I know that Jared Leto is persona non grata these days, perhaps deservedly so, based on some of the chatter around him. But strictly from an acting perspective, We Crashed is one of his best performances. And once again, once again, Anne Hathaway leans into everyone making fun of her in real life to play a woman so utterly ridiculous that it's hard to believe she's a real person. Yet she is. Rebecca Newman is related to Gwyneth Paltrow, and this is some goop-level craziness. It's so funny. We Crashed is also a fascinating look at business, and you will learn a lot about it. Uh, you will learn a lot about business watching this show. I certainly did, you know, about how Wall Street and uh, invest, hedge fund investments work. Because Newman was able to not only game the system, but he also had some brilliant observations and ideas. He actually did have something for a hot moment there. But like Icarus, he flew too close to the sun and his wings melted. So that, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the dropout is about someone who was just a fraud uh, from the very beginning. But Adam Newman, for a moment, he was legit. And that makes his story even more interesting. Number 16, Harley Quinn season three. Not nearly as good as season one and two, I'm afraid. But episode eight, where Harley Quinn, let's just say, becomes Bruce Wayne's psychiatrist, it's the best uh, animated Batman adventure since the Deanie Tim series. It was that good. The first, and I love the idea of Harley Quinn being like kind of Bruce uh, Wayne's psychiatrist and, you know, like doctor patient privilege. So that how, that's how it works with secret identity. I um, mean, it's just so great. So great. Uh, the first two seasons of, I like that development. Now, something else I don't like so much. The first two seasons of Harley Quinn sold me on Harley breaking up with the Joker and striking out on her own as a solo character. I mean, like, in a way that the comic book never did. Never cared for the Jimmy pa uh, Palmiotti, Amanda Connor comic. I don't like that comic. Uh, I still read it, though, because I like Harley Quinn so much as a character. Which is maybe why I didn't like the Birds of Prey movie, because that's what Margot Robbie des decided to base it off of. That's not a great comic. All right, so anyway, uh, this sold me, though, on this, this turn for Harley Quinn. But se and season three kind of sold me on her joining the Bat family, but I still have a lot of problems with it. But this is the closest I've come with being like, okay, let's see where this goes. And ironic, But ironically, the biggest problem this season was that she and Ivy spent too much time together. I mean, I was very happy they didn't have, have them have relationship problems. I mean, they kind of did a little bit because they were spending too much time together. You know, Harley, I guess, true to form, kind of made Ivy her joker and became like obsessed with her. Um, but, but, you know, that was tough to watch because I love them as a couple and I don't want them to have any problems. I don't want anyone to get tired of them. I think they've become one of DC's most famous couples, if not their most famous couple. I love Harley and Ivy, but they still need to maintain their separate identities. They need to not be like... Uh, turned into like one of those celebrity couples where you can't tell when one ends and the other begins. And I think the show maybe did that intentionally because season four seems to be very much about trying to fix that. And I'm excited about that. Some of the developments were very exciting in the season finale. So I'm back in. And I didn't really leave. I love this show. I read the comic that goes with it, which is very adult, by the way, just a heads up. But I, I love this. So good. Uh, number 15, Pachinko. 
You should watch Pachinko. Korean films and shows have become quite popular in the West, as they should, because there's some amazing content coming out of South Korea. But I sure wish more people had discovered Pachinko on Apple TV. I wish this was more part of the, you know, everyone loves Korean content conversation. Thankfully, the show has been renewed for a second season. I don't know when we're getting it, but it's supposed to. And it's gotten some awards recognition. But, you know, there's still hope. But again, in a competitive space like streaming, brilliant shows can fall through the cracks because not only are there too many good shows to honor, but even the networks, well, streaming services themselves, they can't promote. Their slates are so deep because they have to keep churning out so much content. They can't do awards campaigns for everything. And so Pachinko, unfortunately, kind of, again, as I said, fell through the cracks. A lot of Western movies and TV shows explore families through different generations. So it's very refreshing to see it done with a Korean family and Korean history. Uh, a little bit like Ms. Marvel, I learned a lot about Korean history. I think um, even more effectively because what? They had more episodes? Hmm? I'm just saying, six episodes sucks. Uh, Pachinko also underscores on that note the complex relationship between Koreans and the Japanese. The dynamics between China, Japan, and the Koreas are all very complex, rooted in, in rooted in a tumultuous and bloody history. And I always tell you that entertainment can teach and break down stereotypes and break down uh, walls. And I've learned quite a bit thanks to the Ipmon movies and now this about the dynamics in that region. And it's very, fa very, very, very fascinating and interesting. On that note, to see the horrific 1923 earthquake of Yokohama in Japan, which I'd never heard of until this show, and its aftermath, which was deeply disturbing, disturbing, woven into the story, well, that was a little bit like Titanic and, the, and how well it was done and how the drama was so expertly woven into the real world events. And also to see our lead character as a young woman in the 1930s and then as a grandmother in the 1980s and to have the show fill in the blanks as to how she got from point A to point B, and it is a lot of distance between these two, is just really fun to watch. It has also a great uh, opening credit sequence that I never uh, fast forward through or skip. It's good stuff. All right, number 14, The Gilded Age. Ah, The Gilded Age is so good, it finally made Downton Abbey seem obsolete after a decade-long run. Well, Downton Abbey is an, uh, has an upstairs-downstairs feel, largely focusing on a single family and staff. The Gilded Age turns it up a notch, several notches, focusing on multiple great homes, their families and their staffs, but also, also, the political and business developments of the time. I'm learning a lot about The Gilded Age. Really good stuff. Oh, it's so fascinating. This, uh, you know, there are certain periods of history that Hollywood has just done a little bit too much, so we're kind of sick of it. So it's great to dive into these new corners of uh, not only periods in history, but different corners of the globe. I love it. I love history, as you know. Uh, so good. So this makes the show seem more ripped from the pages of history. And while Downton Abbey had a scandal here and there, the Gilded Age is just scandal after scandal after scandal. It's so juicy. Another nice element here that I really love is that, well, you know, I think I've most seen this period depicted in things like uh, American Girl dolls and stuff like that. And I guess kind of a little bit like My Fair Lady, I think, is this time period. But, you know, we have not seen the black community of this era depicted in the mainstream when there were quite a few significant accomplishments like the black upper, cl upper class community uh, that was very strongly established in New York City that should be depicted. And also still, of course, the struggles that these groups were going through uh, and how they themselves were kind of divided in, into, again, this upper class and lower class within the black community itself. History has been, as we all know, largely whitewashed, uh, both in the history books, which is tragic, and then also in entertainment. So for the Gilded Age to be one of the first mainstream shows to represent the past as it truly was in many ways, which I don't want to spoil if you haven't seen the show, is another just another thing that makes it truly a gem. Uh, also, another great intro sequence. I love it. They got the great houses uh, and the and the um, and the trains, and it takes place in New York City. And I, I sometimes well, they have they have like Bloomingdale's there when it was the Bloomingdale Brothers. That's so funny. And I walk over to 62nd Street and Fifth Avenue, and I see what's there now, and I'm like, this is hilarious. All right, number 13, The Sandman. Talk about bringing a comic book to life. The Sandman was worth the wait. Written in the 1990s, it's taken over 30 years to bring it to the screen. But Alan, by Alan Heinberg, though, of Young Avengers and 2017's Wonder Woman fame. This is the guy who should do a, a Young Avengers Disney Plus show if they do, or a movie. However they do the Young Avengers in the MCU, they really should give Alan Heinberg a call. Not just because he created it, but because he's so good. 
Heinberg is, and he, can, and he already has experience in the visual medium of movies and TV as well as comic books. Not a lot of talent can move between those mediums. They're all different skill sets. So that makes Alan, Alan Heinberg should be more famous. I'm certainly doing my part. <laughs> Alan Heinberg, Alan Heinberg, Alan Heinberg. Heinberg is well known for doing a really good job representing the LGBT community with complex, well-written roles. But he can also write other characters as well. He's very good. He's, he's very good in his representation, but I think he's also very good in making that representation mainstream. And he does all of this again with the Sandman. This adaptation might have ruffled a few feathers in the toxic fandoms, but the truth of the matter is, is that Heinberg does a fantastic job of modernizing the material where it needs to be modernized, but also staying true to it where it was ahead of its time. Uh, and like the original comic and all of Neil Gaiman's work, The Sandman is chock full of interesting observations and commentary that really makes you think. But Alan Heinberg makes it accessible, whereas American Gods made it very hard to digest. Although Good Omens is another great, great Neil Gaiman series. It's been very well adapted. That's also coming back, but it, you know, it's not on my discussion because it's from so long ago. <laughs> all right, uh, and, and also add to all of this an incredible budget, Warner Brothers' most expensive show ever, and also one of Netflix's most expensive shows, and you have quite the treat. But the show was so expensive that it almost didn't get renewed for a second season. But thank goodness it did. Uh, number 12, Blackbird. That's right. It's higher than all those other shows. Taron Edgerton might have faded a bit after the Kingsman sequel failed to live up to the original, which was sad. It wasn't that bad. It shouldn't have killed Taron Edgerton's career, quite frankly. But thankfully, he didn't give up. He's starting his comeback, and he's starting out with this impressive new physique. That's a superhero physique if I ever saw one, and an impressive new role to match. Blackbird is the first series headed up by crime novelist and TV writer extraordinaire Dennis Lehane. Lehane, which I'm sure I just mispronounced. But anyway, he's worked on a lot of great television shows, and he's, of course, written a lot of famous books. But this is the first show where he was, I, I'm not sure if he was the showrunner, I think he was, but he developed it and he wrote a lot of the scripts. And it definitely lives up to his legacy. And then some. Borrowing a page from the spectacular and bitterly missed Mindhunter, if you liked Mindhunter, you should watch Blackbird, the FBI basically blackmails drug dealer and arms de dealer Jimmy Keene, true story by the way, to try and get a confession out of a suspected serial killer named Larry Hall. Edgerton and Paul Walter Hauser, at his very best, both at their very best, engage in a stunning game of cat and mouse. Ah, oh, so good. Intercut with flashbacks of Hal's suspected horrific murders. How are you not watching this right now? Ray Liotta is also fantastic in one of his final performances as Keene's father, trying to make amends with his son, before he dies, and maybe contributing to some of his bad habits. It's really good. It's a really touching performance. It really it made me cry. Blackbird is definitely up there with the best prison dramas and crime thrillers. Oh, amazing. And then finally, the show that was so close to my top 10, Julia. Oh, come on, hear me out. You should watch this show too. This is my new Mrs. Maisel. Oh, it's like such, it's comfort food, like Julia Child herself. Another show, though, like Mrs. Maisel, set in the 1960s about an unlikely woman having to fight her way up from ground zero to become a pioneer in her field. But heck, Julia Child created her field. You know, Mrs. Maisel is trying to get into stand-up comedy, which she didn't have to create from scratch. But Julia Child created the cooking show. Not even the modern cooking show. Just the cooking show, period. How incredible is that? And to see how she willed it into existence, how she did it, did it, even paying for it from her, her own money. That is just not only really interesting, but inspiring. Uh, the show also explores the lack of self-confidence women so often have in their appearance and their abilities, and how important it is to just push past that. You just can't let that hold you back. Because so often, you're just, you're just you're second guessing yourself, and the only person you're hurting is you. Just go for it. Sarah Lancashire might be a bit over the top, uh, but it's still a very new, still gives a very nuanced, charming performance in my opinion. And she does, and who doesn't love, by the way, having Niles and Lilith back? I mean, ah, uh, so good. I love, I, I, I just love Niles so much. Uh, he's great on this show. Really, really good. David Hyde Pierce. Uh, I just think of him as Niles, though. Uh, Fran Krantz is also excellent as a producer. I don't want to give anything away about his character, but very good character arc. And Brittany Bradford is also excellent as an aspiring producer. I think she's created for the show to give it a little bit more diversity, but that, you know, it's still a very interesting character. And I think I really like her storyline quite a bit as well, especially how it develops towards the end of the first season. But she is someone 
someone who's an aspiring producer at public television who decides, and this is so important, to help out another woman who also dreams of having a career, and maybe they can help each other. Oh, that was great stuff. Great, great, great. So those are my top 10, run, uh, top 10 runner-ups for series of 2022. Be sure to check out my top 10 as well, uh, and also list your own favorite shows down below. If you haven't seen any of these shows, though, these 20 shows, Ah, oh, you're in for a treat. I'm kind of jealous of you that you get to experience them for the first time. They're just so good. And if you don't like the first one or two episodes, just stick with them. I'm telling you, this is great television. All right, share those thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.